Good afternoon, and welcome to the third and final lecture of the 2022 James D. Strauss Worldview Lectureship. If you have attended both lectures so far, then you will know why I say that they have been both profound and at the same time practical, thought-provoking at one level, and yet also speaking to our lives in relevant ways that apply to our relationships with God, ourselves, and our world. In this morning's lecture, Dr. Selby spoke powerfully about the value of attending to beauty through which we both experience the glory of God and are moved to adore Him, praise Him, and worship Him because of the pleasure that accompanies dwelling in His presence. In his noon lecture, Dr. Selby spoke insightfully about how those aspects of our contemporary culture present obstacles to attending to that kind of transcendence through which we experience such beauty and pleasure and encounter God's presence. And in this final lecture, he has promised to offer helpful guidance for addressing these obstacles and recovering for ourselves the ability to see God in all of the beauty that surrounds us. And in the words of C.S. Lewis, to make every pleasure into a channel of adoration. Uh, this lecture will be entitled Postures of Receptivity, Practices, Caveats, and Promises. And I'm very much looking forward to this lecture. Please welcome again Dr. Gary Selby. Thank you. Again, thank you for inviting me and thank you for attending. And um, I hope this has blessed you. Preparing it has sure blessed me. Here goes. Um, in my last presentation, I tried to map out a little of where we are in this cultural moment. I described it as uh, that map in the um, mall or the airport where you're looking for the restaurant and you look for the red arrow, red arrow that says you are here. Um, I try to note especially how um, we live at a moment when it's, when it's hard to pay attention to beauty and pleasure and to ascribe that pleasure to our loving, joyful creator. In Lewis's words, to trace the sunbeam back to the sun. Part of it is the dizzying pace of technological change, which constantly speeds up the pace of life in a way that makes it uh, hard to stop and look around. More specifically, we live with um, a massive rapid change in communication technology and with a social media technology that is designed to keep us on our devices. Um, I, I read through the Bible in a year, most years, and I use a Bible app. And just this morning, I'm trying to read through my psalm, and all of a sudden, at the bottom of my screen, um, a light starts flashing at me uh, with an advertisement. <laughs> and so, you know, it's like it's hard to look away uh, from the, the, um, those stimuli. Uh, but it's also the epistemological formation in which we tend to look down to reduce human aspirations, human longings and loves, joys, pains, strivings for the good and the true and the beautiful, all to mere physicality, to electrical chemical impulses in our bodies. In Peter Berger's words, we have experienced the secularization of consciousness. As Charles Taylor puts it, we find ourselves alone in a flattened, eminent, mechanized universe cut off from transcendence. What's striking to me is how in tune with those trends C.S. Lewis was. Uh, he got it. He seemed to live quite intentionally within the divide between those two ages. As Chris Armstrong puts it so well, Lewis was a modern medieval man. If you read his book, uh, The Discarded Image, which he wrote as a primer uh, to try and take his students into the social imaginary of the Middle Ages so they'd be able to make some sense of the philosophical and literary text that they were reading in his classes, it almost seems like he's paving the way for the work that Berger and Taylor and others would do later. He says, to look out on the night sky with modern eyes is like looking out over a sea that fades away into mist, or looking about one in a trackless forest, trees forever and no horizon. To look up at the towering medieval universe is much more like looking at a great building. The space of modern astronomy may arouse terror or bewilderment or vague reverie. The spheres 
of old present us with an object in which the mind can rest, overwhelming in its great greatness, but satisfying in its harmony. The medieval person is like a man being conducted through an immense cathedral, not like one lost in a shoreless sea. In his inaugural lecture, De Descriptione, um, uh, inaugural Cambridge lecture, De Descriptione Temporum, he captured the sense of the widening chasm between him, what he called the old Western world and the world that most of his students occupied. And he confessed, I myself uh, belong far more to old Western, to the old Western order than to yours. I read as a native text that you must read as a foreigner. In that same lecture, he spoke of how in the modern world, we mark the passage through our lives in uh, terms of ever-improving technology. As he described it, we live with a new archetypal image. It is the image of old machines being superseded by new and better ones. In the world of machines, the new most often really is better, and the primitive really is the clumsy. Indeed, the replacement of old technology with new represents the very stages of our pilgrimage. And yet, as a modern, he has the capacity to step back and analyze and theorize about both that age and his own, as he does brilliantly in the discarded image, or in this passage from his volume in the Oxford uh, History of English Literature, um, where he discusses the impact of reductionism on our understanding of what it meant to be human. He writes, By reducing nature to her mathematical elements, it substituted a mechanical for a genial or animistic conception of the universe. The world was emptied first of her indwelling spirits, then of her occult sympathies and antipathies, finally of her colors, smells, and tastes. The result was a dualism rather than materialism. The mind on whose ideal construction the whole method depended stood over against its object um, in ever sharpening or ever sharper dissimilarity. Man with his new powers became rich like Midas, but all that he touched had gone dead and cold. And so Lewis names the shifts that Taylor and Berger and others would later explore but not only does he name the shifts, he pushes back against them. For Christians, as I talk about in my book, uh, Pursuing an Earthy Spirituality, he pushes against what he calls negative spirituality, the tendency to elevate the negative, sacrifice, deprivation to the highest good, as if God's aim ultimately for, was for us to be empty and to be deprived. Even more, he pushes back negative spirituality in the, in the sense of the tendency to separate physicality from spirituality in a way that sees becoming spiritual as moving further and further away from our bodies and from the physical and the earthy. It's the legacy of Cartesian dualism that believed we were most human when we have cut off our bodies and moved into the realm of abstract thought. And this is what he gets at um, in the opening of our text when he talks about the attempt to worship God in response to abstract ideas, the goodness and greatness of God and the like. For Lewis, that was a disaster. <laughs> it dishonors God's good creation, but it also cuts us off from what is in many ways our most direct access to the glory of God, which comes to us in our physical senses. So for Christians especially, Lewis invited us back into an earthy spirituality. But he also invited all of his readers, Christians and non-Christians alike, to re-enter an imaginative world that was enchanted. Over and over again, we see elements of the pre-modern imagination in Lewis's writings. In an overall sense, this is Michael Ward's argument in Planet Narnia, where each book in the Chronicles of Narnia represents a period under the sway of a different heavenly body from medieval cosmology. In the, in the, um, the voyage of the Dawn Treader, it's the sun, Saturn. And of course, in uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, it is Jupiter, whom Lewis describes as a king at peace, enthroned, taking his leisure, serene. The jovial character is cheerful, festive, yet temperate, tranquil, magnanimous. 
When this planet dominates, we may expect the halcyon days of prosperity. It's the figure of Father Christmas who evokes both joy and awe. We see Lewis's preoccupation with portals that open the door between our world and the world beyond, something that perhaps first captivated his imagination when he read George MacDonald's Fantasties. So we get a magic wardrobe and a painting on the wall of a ship that suddenly becomes real and pulls you into Narnia. You have this odd hint of sacred time where in Narnia, years go by. Decades have passed, and then when you return, it's the moment after you left. You get Lucy's cordial given to her by Father Christmas with these words, In this bottle there is a cordial made of the juice of the fire flowers that grow in the mountains of the sun. If you or any of your friends are hurt, a few drops will restore them. And you see the kind of honoring and desire that Charles Taylor points to as a feature of the medieval world, the place of carnival. And so toward the end of Prince Caspian, Bacchus shows up. Um, and in the company of Aslan, they feast and dance and have a romp. And at the end of Paralandra, all of creation joins together in the grand cosmic dance. If you know Lewis's writings, it's everywhere, all in the service of inviting us to imagine a re-enchanted cosmos. But especially, Lewis invites us to experience that re-enchantment through our encounters with beauty and pleasure. For Lewis, recovering beauty, and especially the physical, sensory apprehension of beauty as the manifestation, the inbreaking of God's glory, lies at the center of that enchantment. Now, in his early life, these experiences of beauty, what he describes as joy, come to him as bolts out of the blue. They come over him unsought and unexpected, and then just as quickly, the sensation is gone. We see this, for example, in his, um, of course, his accounts of the experience of joy in his book, The Surprised by Joy, but we also see it in one of his early poems published in 1919, more than a decade before his conversion, titled Dungeon Greats. He speaks of the strange power of unsought beauty in some casual hour and how from its glory's midmost heart out leaps a sudden beam of larger light into our souls. All things are seen aright amid the blinding pillar of its gold. And then he says with a hint of sadness, the miracle is done. A bolt out of the blue. However, in letters to Malcolm, letter 17, we see a shift toward the possibility of experiencing a more sustained sense of God's presence through the disciplined attention to pleasure or beauty. So note again that snippet of conversation at the very beginning of that letter. Lewis is struggling to worship God. Uh, he thinks he needs to somehow summon, summon up fervor in response to theological abstractions, and the dial is not moving. And Malcolm, it says, once more, turned to the brook, scooped up some water, and splashed his burning face and asked, why not begin with this? And what we see in that moment is intentionality. It is a disciplined awareness. And where he goes with this is to offering the possibility of actually practicing this on a regular basis, as if beauty might actually become a habitus, a place to dwell. And that's what I want us to think about in this final lecture. Now, uh, this talk comes with a warning label, and here it is. Lewis and others are clear. We do not manufacture or control the presence of God. Lewis will always warn about judging um, our prayer and worship by the emotional state that we leave with. He reminds us that even our Christian practices of 
of spirituality can become our own form of idolatry, that Christian practices can become idolatry when they become our way of controlling our fate, staving off bad things, even summoning up the presence of God by means of the performance of particular actions. Like John of the Cross, Lewis will counsel us that sometimes God in mercy leads us into times of aridity, times of dryness, times in the desert. In the screw tape letters, Lewis will talk about the law of undulation, where sometimes we're at the top of our game and sometimes we're not where sometimes God even withdraws our sensory apprehension of the divine presence in order to give us the space to exercise our own wills. And yet, there is this possibility for how certain habitual practices might open us up to dwelling in the beauty of the glorious presence of the Lord. When we lived in California, in Southern California, my sons spent uh, several summers out there with us at, at Pepperdine, and my younger son Tyler learned to surf. He would work. Uh, he was working for Pepperdine. They were digitizing their own their old uh, registration records, so he spent the day scanning. Uh, uh, records uh, over and uh, all day long, but he would get up at like six in the morning and go out and surf for an hour or two, and he learned how to surf. And he would describe the experience of surfing as a, as kind of this, it was a spiritual experience. Um, and in a way that he said, you know, you can't, you are not manufacturing the wave. All you can do is get out there and try to position your board. And as the wave came along, you would paddle like crazy, trying to put yourself in a position where the wave could take you and, and carry you in. And in a way, that's, that's what these practices do for us. And so recognizing all that, I titled this final presentation, Postures of Receptivity. What would it mean to put ourselves in a posture where this might come to us? And so in this um, final talk, I want to highlight two practices that I think go together. Now, um, one other little caveat, that's, this has been a long buildup to uh, these two practices. And if you are waiting for some startling new revelation of something you've never heard before, you're going to be disappointed. In fact, what I'm about to tell you is so simple, so deceptively simple, and yet it may be the hardest thing we ever do, especially in this cultural moment. So here goes. The first is simply the practice of attention, the practice of attention. Lewis lays out this amazing possibility of living always with a sense of being touched by a finger of that right hand at whose right hand are pleasures forevermore. Which raises the question, why wouldn't we do this all the time? And Lewis, of course, answers the way any of us would. I'm just not paying attention. And in this, Lewis points us to the starting point of worship and adoration the discipline of attention. As I've written elsewhere for Lewis, this is the foundation of all Christian spirituality. It is rooted in awareness or consciousness and choice or agency, becoming more and more and more aware of ourselves and others and the world and especially of God, and then doing what we do more and more and more out of our own will, out of our own choice. And that starts with opening our eyes. In his science fiction book, Paralandra, Lewis describes how the character Elwyn Ransom travels to Paralandra, which is Venus, the Eros planet, of course, and he has this experience on one of that world's floating islands. Ransom comes upon what looks at, at first like to be large spherical bulbs of glass hanging from tree branches through which the reflect, refracted sunlight sends out a stream of rainbow colors. And he reaches up, as any of us would, to touch one, and it bursts, showering him with a spray of deliciously fragrant ice-cold water. Lewis describes Ransom's ecstatic baptism in these words. His nostrils filled with a sharp, 
shrill, exquisite sense, scent that somehow brought to his mind the verse in Pope, die of a rose in aromatic pain. It's just so good, it's killing me. <laughs> Such was the refreshment that he seemed himself to have been till now but half awake. When he opened his eyes, which had closed involuntarily at the shock of moisture, all the colors about him seemed richer, and the dimness of that world seemed clarified. A re-enchantment fell upon him. It's like all of his life he's been living in a stupor, and finally he's become aroused from that stupor. In the same way, Lewis believed that spirituality involved being fully awake, the awakening of consciousness in the mind and heart of the Christian. And of course, in this, Lewis joins a chorus of, vo verse of voices calling us to be attentive, to open our eyes, to tune our bodies and our senses to what is happening within us and around us. When Simone Weil wanted to talk about prayer, something else I have my, my students read, he says it's really a matter of paying attention. Prayer is really a matter of just paying attention, training ourselves to be attentive to God. And she said, that's why school studies are so helpful, even the ones you don't like, or maybe especially the ones that you don't like, because they help you develop the capacity for attention. I still have my students read snippets of the bestseller that many of us oldsters read decades ago by M. Scott Peck, The Road Less Traveled. You remember that? The Road Less Traveled. Some of the best wisdom on discipline and love that I've ever read. And when Peck comes to defining what it means to love, the first word out of his mouth is attention. The love is the capacity, the will to attend fully to another person. If you know the literature around emotional intelligence and also trauma recovery, you will know how much of that wisdom is centered in our capacity for attention. Emotional triggers uh, come to us and manifest themselves first in physiological reactions. Anxiety comes to us first in a faint fluttering in the diaphragm and maybe a sense of feeling lightheaded. Uh, um, and part of recovery is learning to be attentive to those physiological manifestations. For Lewis, developing virtue as Christians was centered in our being attentive to the emotional reactions that we have to people and situations that we face. In the screw tape letters, uh, screw tape tells Wormwood that when the patient, that is the Christian, is under the spell of fear or lust or anger, keep his attention focused on the object of his anger. That is the stimulus evoking those emotions. Do not let it come into his awareness. I am having feelings of anger. I am afraid, etc. So you imagine the situation, something happens, somebody does something, and you become angry. You feel anger. Think about all those physiological changes that come over you, a churning feeling in your stomach, tightness in your chest, muscles are tense, your face feels hot. Our tendency when that happens is to focus on the object of our anger. But what happens when we experience this sudden flash of self-awareness? Hey, I'm getting angry. All of a sudden, Lewis says, the intensity of that emotion is greatly diminished, as also with fear, as also with lust. It's brilliant. It's what we see in examples of Jesus when he is aware, so attentive, and when he is calling other people to pay attention, calling attention to flowers. Consider the lilies of the field, birds, mustard seeds, holding children in his lap. You can't do that unless you're going to be attentive to them. When the woman in the crowd touches the hem of his garment, he notices. At the home of Simon the Pharisee, when Jesus is anointed and then Simon is thinking these thoughts about this woman, Jesus will say, Simon, do you see this woman? To the disciples at the well in John 4, as that woman he encountered is running back into town, he will say, open your eyes. The fields are white unto harvest. 
And so Lewis invites us to be carefully attentive to the endless succession of small pleasures that come to us every day. From the first taste of the air in the morning, our whole cheek can become a kind of palate, down to our soft slippers at bedtime. When I'm talking with students about this, I will often stop and have them, I won't make you do this, but I'll tell you some of what they come up with, um, turn to their neighbor and just brainstorm a little bit about just some of the simple, mundane pleasures that you experience as you go through your day. And here's some of what we come up with. The first taste of coffee in the morning, if you're a coffee drinker. I love that first taste of coffee. Different foods, the first bite of your favorite cake, singing. I sing in our little choir, and, and it's a flow experience. You know, if you know the psychology of flow, when we're singing together. Uh, here's one of my favorite. You've been out maybe hiking or walking or working, and it's kind of cold and rainy, and you step into a hot shower. Isn't that a great feeling, that, that hot, air, hot um, water hitting you? Uh, most recently, one of my students pointed out the pleasure of dry socks dry socks when you're you know you've been out hiking and um, and your feet are wet and just the feeling of putting on dry socks um, cool surfaces of your pillow when you turn your pillow over <laughs> for me uh, it's lying down for that nap I usually take a um, on Sundays I'll take a, it's about a five minute nap and then a cup of coffee but uh, for me the pleasure is the feeling of crawling you know laying down on the couch I will always say it's so delicious um, attention just being attentive we have um, a hundred of these a day, and we just blow past them. And so for Lewis, the first step in developing this kind of adoration that opens us up to the constant presence of God is just learning to pay attention. But then the second practice, and I have called this, um, as I'm struggling with how to put this, a practice of communal memory, communal memory where our experience of uh, the att uh, uh, attentive experience of pleasure gets joined with our memory, our shared memory of the Christian story. And what I'm talking about is the kind of practice that puts the story of God deep in our bones, in what Charles Taylor calls our social imaginary, what the Dean of African American Homiletics, Henry Mitchell, called our intuitive consciousness. So that our fundamental consciousness of the world and ourselves and other people is rooted in the story of God. In his book, um, the, the End of Memory, which I highly recommend, it's a, it's a book that is, has been so helpful to me in the last few years, Miroslav Volf talks about how we live through the bad things that happen to us, especially what we do with memories of trauma and grievance and our own failures and our own missed opportunities. He tells of how, as a citizen of Yugoslavia, he had to return to his country to fulfill his compulsory um, military service. But he was a PhD student in a United States university, married to a US citizen, and a pacifist to boot. Uh, and so it was assumed that he had to be a US agent. And so while there, shortly after he showed up, he was arrested and subjected to a period of intense mental torture at the hands of a brutal interrogator that he names simply Captain G. And the memory of that trauma and grievance remains with him. And so his book struggles, or his book centers on the struggle to deal with that memory. He says, I can't forget it. I can't forget Captain G. But I don't want to continue nursing it. I don't want to continue hating the perpetrator. Indeed, the question he asks is, how does he remember grievance as a follower of Christ, whose death brings redemption and the reconciliation of all things? And so that's the question he centers on. What do we do with these memories? How do we keep our bad memories from taking over all of our emotional and mental bandwidth? How do we keep those from foreclosing any possibility of a hopeful future? And his answer is complex and multi-layered, but central to Wolf's response to the memory of trauma is the crucial need, he says, for interpreting memories and inscribing them into a larger pattern of meaning, 
a pattern supplied by the communal memory of the biblical narrative, anchored in the Exodus and the Passion. Taken together, they offer a framework of meaning centered in God's deliverance, forgiveness, and reconciliation. It's what Paul does with his own painful memories of persecuting the church. They take on new meaning within the story of grace. What Wolf emphasizes is um, how much we need what communication and literary theorists have called um, an interpretive community. Interpretive community. Interpretive communities are um, comprised of people who share a common narrative, a common identity, who possess a shared epistemological framework or a shared code of sense making. So there's a fascinating um, uh, article I read years ago on um, Mormons in Las Vegas. You know, you think, Mormons in Las Vegas, how in the world do they keep their faith from just being eventually just snuffed out? Um, because we sort of assumed, you know, that media was like a hyperdermic needle, needle. All that secularity is just kind of getting in and they can't get away from it. And what we discovered is, no, they are filtering all those experiences through a shared uh, a, a code system, a, a way of making sense of the world. So they, they had these ways. It's like, you know, if you're a, if you're a Mormon, you got to work harder if you live in Vegas, <laughs> you know, and they would be, they would have the shared narrative of like, you know, what a great opportunity we have to share the gospel in this place. And, and so kind of what they're doing is they're filtering these experiences through a shared narrative as a community of interpretation. And that's what Wolf is suggesting um, that we need for the negative experiences. And what all of that points to is the central place of the intentional uh, practices that will cause sacred memory, the story of God, to take deep root in our consciousness. Of course, the practice of prayer and dwelling in Scripture, but especially the ecclesial practices of gathered worship, communion, singing, celebration of Advent and Lent and Holy Week and Resurrection and Pentecost within the, litur within the liturgical calendar, because, as Peter Berger says, we know in community we need the support of a, of a social plausibility structure for this to be real in our consciousness. Hearing each Sunday the Lord's Prayer and the doxology on the lips of children for whom that habitual act has been all they've ever known. Practices of shared testimony to deliver, of deliverance. All of these have the capacity to imprint the Christian story on our consciousness. And what Wolf is arguing is that the only hope I have for dealing with my memory of trauma uh, from preventing it um, from taking over my life is for it to be embedded somehow, inscribed somehow into the Christian story. Well, where's Lewis in all this? I think that it, Lewis is inviting us into the other side of the coin. It's not just the bad things that happen to us. It's also the good things. They become meaningful to us as we inscribe those experiences within the story of God. And to do that, we need to live into our theology. And so as he puts in letters to Malcolm a little later, it's kind of on the back page, this great pithy phrase, he said, one wants the books. One wants the books. Lewis recognizes the limits of beauty, especially the limits of beauty in nature. He recognizes that, that seeing beauty in nature is itself a form of intentional or selective attention. It has the power to evoke, but it does not force us to lift up our eyes to God. And it's always susceptible to idolatry. Indeed, in the four loves, he warns against the kind of idolatry that makes gods of the feelings that come over us in those moments as a person uh, might who betrays the covenant of marriage under a soaring and iridescent eros. Lewis also reminds us that without a theological lens, we might easily conclude that nature is pitiless. For, as he reminds us, there are worms in the belly, as well as primroses in the wood. Instead, what the experience of beauty gives us, he says, is an iconography, a language of images. 
I do not mean simply visual images. It is the moods or spirits themselves, the powerful expositions of terror, gloom, jocundity, cruelty, lust, innocence, purity that are the images. In them, each person can clothe his or her own belief. See what he's doing here. He is joining these experiences in nature with what we believe about God. He notes especially the role that beauty in nature played in the development of his own sense of God's character. He says, nature gave the world glory, a meaning for me. I do not see how the fear of God would have meant anything to me, um, would have meant anything to me, but the lowest prudential efforts to be safe if I had never seen certain ominous ravines and unapproachable crags. And if nature had never awakened certain longings in me, huge areas of what I now mean by the love of God would never, so far as I can see, have existed. And so, he says, the created glory may be expected to give us hints of the uncreated, for the one is derived from the other and in some fashion reflects it. We have seen an image of the glory. But all of this depends on our having cultivated a particular way of seeing beauty in the world on our having learned to recognize the rays of heavenly splendor dressed in such a disguise. And so, Lewis insists, we must make a detour. Leave the hills and woods and go back to our studies, to church, to our Bibles, to our knees. For nature cannot satisfy the longings uh, can, cannot satisfy the desire she arouses, nor answer theological questions, nor sanctify us. Our real journey to God involves constantly turning our backs on her, passing from the dawnlit fields into some pokey little church, or it might be going to work in an East End parish. And so, even as we learn to be attentive, we also embrace the practices of communal memory, the practices that enable us to join our experiences of pleasure and beauty with the Christian story, with our theology. And both elements come together in what Lewis points to as the act of adoration. Being present to the beauty, being present to the pleasure from the first taste of the air on my cheek down to my soft slippers at bedtime. And we turn our attention to God in the prayer that says, God, how good you are to have created this. As Lewis presents it, it's almost like a two-step process. Step one, eat the Hershey's Kiss mindfully and enjoy it. Step two, ascribe praise to God for that pleasure. But here's where this leads. To return to letters to Malcolm, letter 17, I think it's um, about two-thirds of the way down on that front page. A little past half. He describes the phenomenon of hearing a bird. We hear this sound and we say, I hear a bird. But what act is actually going on is that we are hearing a sound and we are decoding that sound by running through the catalog of sounds stored up in our brains looking for the closest match. And when we get a match, we say, I hear a bird. It's just that we have had so much practice, we do it instantly. In the same way, he says, we don't just read words on a page. What we are seeing is black marks against a white field and our mind decodes them. It's just that we have had so much practice that our minds make the connection instantly. And in fact, it's hard to go back from seeing words on the page to just marks. It's almost like you have to squint a little bit and blur your vision. And then Lewis says, if we were diligent enough 
in our attention to beauty as it comes to us in the form of pleasure, savoring these glimpses of the glory of God as it strikes our sensibilities, and then turning our attention to God, the Creator, in the prayer that says, how wonderful you are. What must you be like to have given me this? Then we might come to the point when experience, experiencing beauty and pleasure and the praise of God were no longer two separate steps. We would, we would learn, he says, to read pleasures in the same way that we read words on the page. There would be instant recognition of the presence of God, and we would experience every beauty and every pleasure as sacrament. To receive it, he says, and to recognize its divine source are a single experience. This heavenly fruit is instantly redolent of the orchard where it grew. This sweet air whispers of the country from whence it blows. It is a message. We know we are being touched by a finger of that right hand at which there are pleasures forevermore. There no need, there, there need be no question of thanks or praise as a separate event, something done afterwards to experience the tiny theophany is itself to adore. In that moment, all of those little pleasures, all of our experiences of beauty that come to us a hundred times a day would all be theophanies, moments when we are experiencing the presence of God without even thinking about it. And in that moment, truly, the whole world would be full of the glory of God. And in this, we are moving into the world of mystical experience. Think about what we said about those experiences. They are non-discursive in the sense that we're not engaged in talk about, rather we're in. Direct encounters that are akin to how we experience color or taste. In those moments, we feel expansive, effusive, overcome with a sense of oneness with God and with the world. There's that scene in the screw tape letters when the patient suddenly recovers his sense of God's presence and it happens in a moment when he's immersed in the beauty and the pleasure of physical creation. Without actively thinking about God, he is engulfed in the presence of God. Screwtape calls it the asphyxiating cloud, which prevents the tempter from um, even getting through. Screwtape says, it is the enemy's, that is God's, most barbarous weapon and generally appears when God is directly patient to the patient. God is directly present to the patient under certain modes not yet fully classified. <laughs> He's describing the mystical experience there. What screw tape is unable to grasp it is that it is precisely through the encounter with the glory of God incarnated in beauty and received as the sensory experience of pleasure that makes God somehow directly present to the Christian. And it seems that through diligent practice, some Christians actually come to make their home there. As screw tape concludes, some humans are permanently surrounded by it and therefore inaccessible to us. And so God remains, as Lewis puts it several times, the bright blur. And yet, as the mystic suggested, Lewis gives us a discipline that uses our minds and yet bypasses our constant tendency to rationalize, to explain, to try and create mental constructs that theorize God. It's a practice with the potential to open us up to the joyful, mystical union with God as we attend to beauty and pleasures that come to us through our senses. And that leads me to a final word of hope. This feels like a tough time for Christianity in the United States. I'm sure you've seen the headlines about the steep decline of the number of people who claim to be Christians in the United States, a precipitous decline. But in the face of that, 
I think about what Charles Taylor said at the end of his massive volume. Have we succeeded in eclipsing God? And the answer is no. We are still haunted by transcendence. The glory of God breaks in among us still. Just over a year ago, I came across a review by Christine Emba, who writes for the Washington Post, um, about the latest novel of a, a rising young Irish novelist, Sally Rooney, who's been dubbed the um, commercially anointed voice of millennial Malays. How'd you like to be that? The commercially anointed voice of the millennial Malays. She chronicles the rom romantic longings of a generation, of her generation, that feels adrift in a broken world. And um, Rooney's written a number of books that give voice to that malaise. But as I read the review, it seemed like this one, which she entitles, Beautiful World, Where Are You?, had taken a different turn. Here's the paragraph from Emba's review that hooked me. In Beautiful World, however, she writes, they, the characters, these young millennials, are exploring a different way of being. Now for spoilers. The characters trade in showy declarations of Marxism for a quiet search for meaning. They're deeply curious about religion. Casual sex is critiqued. Commitment holds the most allure. A church wedding is the setting for one of the book's most transcendent moments. A baby even appears. So I got the book from my library and I started reading. Now I have to warn you, what I didn't realize when I started reading was that Rooney has become known for her graphic sex scenes, and so I don't recommend it. I hesitate to bring it up. <laughs> but you know what made it harder for me to read than the sex scenes, and they were pretty hard, quite honestly, was just how boring the first hundred pages were. The characters are doing life. They're making money, at least enough to get by. They have the occasional party. They have casual sex. And it's, it's almost like they're living the culture's definition of the good life. And yet their lives are boring, banal. And I almost quit reading. Because I was just like, oh, this is killing me. Until it hit me that this was exactly what Rooney was trying to capture. That sense of, of emptiness, the sense of wanting something more and the possibility that they might actually think about finding it within institutions that seem so outdated. Marriage, the family, the church, faith in God. And oddly, it filled me with a sense of hope that the longing for transcendence, the longing for God, has never left us. And in the face of that, I think about what C.S. Lewis offered when he wrote about beauty and pleasure, the sense of longing that he called joy. I've been talking about this for decades, and I have yet to find an audience of people who haven't felt it. We think of Lewis as an apologist, as if he were giving logical arguments that twist people's arms behind them back, their backs and make them cry, I'm a believer. <laughs> But I think that what he really does is something a little different. I think what Lewis really does is just raise a tantalizing question. He invites us to be present to those haunting glimpses, the sense of longing, the way our heart skips in the presence of beauty, and to ask a tantalizing question, what if? What might this be? It might be nothing. And it might be just some cruel trick of nature. This thing that you've always longed for. But wouldn't that be a tragic irony? The one thing you've truly longed for beyond all other longings is the one that you never find. That thing to which all your strivings point to, but never came to fruition. But what if? What if they really were pointing you to something real and true, the most real and true thing in the universe? What if those turned out to be a clue to the purpose for which you are made? What if they were your glimpses of the very nature of the universe? What if they were your pointer to God? 
What a powerful message of hope that would be to the world. May that be the shape of our lives. May that be the message of hope that we hold out to our world. We have time for a few questions. If anybody has them, if you would please, if you have questions, for the sake of those who are online, uh, if you wouldn't mind coming over here. And yeah, Brandon, I know that he's walking out the way over the other side. Yeah. <laughs> get some, uh, get but your that's steps why we in. have this here so everyone can hear. Welcome to Lincoln. Uh, please forgive if this question is too elementary or off key or outside no, your no. expertise. Um, the transcendental are classically uh, classic the good, the true, and the beautiful. Am, yeah, I, yeah. I, am I accurate there? I've been trying to locate those. Um, are those are those do we ground those in scripture right. as special revelation, or do we receive them just as good human wisdom through general revelation? I, I'm trying to one obviously in my mind would give more weight than the other. Yeah. What where do they come from in your understanding? I mean, I would, I'm, I have accessed them through Hans Urs von Balthasar, who connects them to medieval um, theology. And so um, I haven't thought about, I'm, I, I, I think they're rooted in scripture, um, but I would need to think about certainly, um, you know, the, the examples that I mentioned earlier this morning um, focus on the direct encounters with God and how often those encounters with God include experiences of great beauty. And so I, I think those would, be, there, those would be examples of how that might um, be represented. That's a good question. So. Well, if we have no other questions, then let's thank Dr. Selby once again. Uh, for all the hard work I know he put into these lectures and the enthusiasm with which he was able to share all this with us, it's been a, uh, a great day. Well, thank you so Gary, much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for the invitation, and it's just, it's been wonderful. So, God bless you all. Uh, I tell you what, before before we leave, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Selby if you would, if you'd join me over here. And I'd like to ask us to stand and uh, pray. And I'm going to ask Brian Jester, our, uh, our dean through the faculty, to come and join me too. Let's join the two of us over here. And uh, we would pray for, uh, first of all, for God to continue to cover his family mm -hmm. at this time. Thank you. Uh, but also for uh, for safe keeping as he mm -hmm. travels back home and continues mm -hmm. his ministry and we thank God that God yeah, will thank you. continues to come. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. Yes, Lord. We repent of the many beauties we have seen around us today on the broadcast. We pray you to help us as we seek to adopt these postures of receptivity we might not miss a single moment of opportunity to enjoy the pleasure of your presence. Uh, we pray also that you would help us to be the ones through whom perhaps others can learn about your story and in learning to share this story together find every day to be able to make the pleasure of your presence. We also pray right now your comfort. Uh, thank you for the faith that Gary's family shares, but still, we pray your comfort for them during this time of change in their lives in this chapter of the history of the faith. We also pray your watch here over him as he uh, drives and flies home. And uh, we pray for the
for the success and the, uh, for you to use the ministry of our sister school, Emmanuel Christian Seminary, and for our brothers and sisters, colleagues in the kingdom work there on today. And uh, I pray that through us, that uh, our culture might be able to find in us a vision for hope mm. that our culture so desperately seeks. We ask and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you all for being Thank with you. us for the, today. Thank today. you so much. That was wonderful. Good job.